Welcome to my essential philosophy and literature readings and lectures. I'm Andri and I do warmly welcome you. Today we shall discuss uh, on the earliest forms of the Persian language and literature. In its earliest form, as we all know, the Persian language appears in the cuneiform inscriptions of the Achaemenian kings of kings written between the 6th and 4th centuries BC. After the destruction of the old Persian Empire by Alexander the Great, it disappeared from historical records for several centuries until from the 3rd century AD onwards, and it was adopted again as a literary medium called the Middle Persian or Pahlavi by Sasanian kings, Zoroastrians and Manichaeans. In the 7th century, when the Arabs brought the religion of Islam to Persia, another major break occurred in the continuity of Persian culture. Arabic became the exclusive medium of literature culture in the dominating Muslim community. However, already in the second half of the 9th century, Persian began to be used in writing again in the eastern provinces of the Abbasid Caliphate. Political circumstances which brought rulers of lo local origin into power favoured the rapid development of a new Persian language, and in many ways it was some kind of typical product of the civilization of Islam. The script, a large section of the vocabulary, and many literary forms were derived from Arabic. Moreover, the latter language remained an important factor in Persian culture, where it continued to play more or less the same role as Latin did in medieval Europe. Arabic was particularly dominant in the religious disciplines, one of which was the science of Sufism. Until the 20th century, when it was significantly modernized under Western influence, Persian poetry was a highly formalized artistic tradition. To write a poem meant, in the first place, to apply certain unchangeable rules covering prosody, imagery, and the use of very powerful and rich rhetorical devices. A basic rule of prosody was that each poem should be constructed as a sequence of distichs or baits. The two half verses of each distich are virtually identical as far as their metrical patterns are concerned. The rhyme is either internal, AA, or only final, BA, linking the line with the other distichs of the poem. The former marks the distich as an opening line, which we shall see in my outgoing post in Readings Hayam, if the poem is a lyric, of course, but the latter could be used in any other line. In this way, most verse forms current in the tradition can be detected and most verse forms can be defined. The most important are the Qatrain or Rubai, the Qasida, the Qazal and the Masnavi. To each of these four verse forms, one of the chapters in my outgoing posts will be fully devoted. Initially, this poetry was almost entirely a matter of the medieval Persian courts and therefore essentially a secular tradition. The characteristic form was the Qasida, which was most often used for poems of praise. When the Sufis began to write Persian poems, they adapted many forms of court poetry to their own ends. Sufi poetry, therefore, retained several traces of this origin. 
The distinction with secular poetry is therefore sometimes very difficult to make. And on the other hand, the remarkable expansion of Sophie poetry equally made its impact on the poetry of the world so that eventually the lines distinguishing the two became vague. And this caused very, very serious problems for the interpretation of Persian poetry, especially as far as the lyrical genre of the Ghazal is concerned. The controversy surrounding the mystical or non-mystical readings of Hafiz poetry is the most typical example. A mystical trend must have been present in Islam from the very beginning. The English word Sufism, as Islamic mysticism is usually referred to, was derived from the Arabic tasabuf, which according to the most likely explanation originally meant to don a woolen cloak. It would then refer to the predominance during the first few centuries of ascetic piety, influenced, as it seems, by the practices of Christian hermits in the Syrian desert. Accounts of the acts and the sayings of the early sheikhs are preserved in an extensive hagiographical literature written in Arabic and Persian languages. Already, as we all know, in the 8th century, the second of the Islamic era, more reflective books appeared, which marked the beginnings of a very rich flowering of Sufi literature in prose and poetry composed over the centuries in every cultural language of the Islamic world. And these works cover the various aspects of mystical experience and ethics, as well as metaphysical theory, as from the late 12th century onwards, it developed out of a merger of philosophy and Sufism, the most influential body of mystical doctrine was Muhi Adin ibn al-Arabi's theosophy known as the thesis of Vahdat al-Wujud or the unity of being. Now, the first Sufi poets about whom we have any knowledge were Arabs. I do highlight this. Love poetry of great intensity has been attributed to the great mystics, such as the poetess Rabia of Basra, the Egyptian saint Dunun and Al-Halaj of Baghdad, executed in 1922, whom the Persian poet celebrated as the prime example of sacrifice for love's sake under the name of Mansur. When in the 11th century Persian Sufis started to write and read poetry, they continued a long-standing practice, which was Arabic practice. The Persians, however, were able to create a lasting and extremely fertile tradition, whereas Arabic literature of later centuries produced few mystical poets of any importance besides Ibn al-Farid and Ibn al-Arabi, who wrote the mystical love poems collected in Tajuman al-Ashwaq. The size of my post, which I shall be writing in my near future, it makes it impossible to include an introduction to Sufism. And for this, uh, every listener and every reader of my Buy Me A Coffee page should turn to one of the works which I shall mention in my bibliography. The focus of my attention will be the reflections of mysticism in Persian poetry and the mystical concepts one needs to be familiar while reading Persian poetry in order to understand the words of the poets are comparatively few. Many of them concern general items, for example, of religious ethics rather than intricate points of esoteric doctrine. 
and the brief explanations given in the course of the exposition will probably be enough for the listener and the reader who has only a general knowledge of Sufi ideas.